Um, I am going to be talking about demystifying the right heart. And I am really excited to talk about this topic. And I just want to start by telling you guys why. So when I was a kid, I was terrified of this plant. Um, this is a plant from a musical called Little Shop of Horrors, and it eats people. Uh, that is the entire premise of this musical. And I was terrified of this plant as a kid. I was convinced it was going to grow under my bed while I was sleeping and eat me, which in retrospect makes no sense because plants are not known for being mobile and agile predators. But at the age of six, this made perfect sense to me. In the similar vein, right heart ultrasound used to be really scary for me. It was intimidating. I wasn't super convinced that it was going to be clinically useful for me. I wasn't sure it was worth the time to learn. But just like I was wrong about this plant eating me in the middle of the night, I was wrong about right heart ultrasound. It is definitely useful. It does not need to be intimidating. And today I'm going to talk about some of the ways that you can look for this and incorporate it into your clinical practice. So I want to start by talking about why. Why would we look for dysfunction of the right heart? Well, what we're looking for Really, we're talking about pulmonary embolism here, but anything that's gonna cause acute and sudden right heart strain. And a lot of times for us, that's PE. And the ways in which this can be very useful to you are those clinically unstable patients that can't get to CT, or maybe you don't have time to get to CT, and you're thinking of starting heparin, or you're even start thinking of starting pushing TPA, and you need confirmation that your diagnosis is correct. And ultrasound can be extremely helpful for you there because there are multiple signs and things that you can look for that can lead you towards this diagnosis. And of course, the second question is always how? So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take you through three of the commonly performed point of care echocardiogram views, views that you're already using in your point of care echocardiograms. And we're gonna talk about looking for right heart dysfunction on those views. So let's start with the parasternal long axis, kind of the bread and butter of the point of care echocardiogram. This is the view where we have our ultrasound probe placed right about where the V2 sticker goes. And we are pointing that indicator at the right shoulder if we have the ultrasound probe in cardiac mode. And we should see something that looks roughly like this. Uh, this is my current ultrasound fellow's heart. It is a normal heart. He does not have right heart dysfunction. And the way that I know that, at least based on this view that I'm able to obtain, is I'm looking at roughly the size of the right ventricular outflow tract, which is the chamber at the top of the screen, the aortic outflow tract, which is directly below it, and the left atrium. All three of those chambers should be roughly the same size. And if one is significantly larger than the others, well, there's probably a problem in that chamber. So if that chamber at the top of the screen, the chamber closest to the blue dot, is significantly larger than the other two chambers that I'm looking at, well, I have a problem and I'm concerned that the right ventricle is dilated. So let's take a look at what that might look like. So if we look at this image here, the chamber at the top of the screen, the right ventricular outflow tract is significantly larger than the aortic outflow tract or the left atrium. You'll note that I'm not talking about the left ventricle at all. That's because the talk is focused on the right ventricle. So although we might normally use this view to look at the left ventricle, we can look at the right ventricle too. And the reason that I think that this is important is because often we talk about looking at the right ventricle, we only talk about the apical four chamber view. And I think we all know that in a critically ill patient, we might not be able to get that view. We might only be able to get, say, the parasternal long. So I think it's important to realize that you can start looking for right heart dysfunction in this very first view in this parasternal long axis view. So the next view that we would normally obtain would be the parasternal short axis view. So we would swing over, we would get our classic fish mouth view, we're looking at that left ventricle while watching it concentrically contract around a point. And this view primarily shows us the left ventricle. So why am I talking about it in a talk focused on the right heart? Well, because we can look for something called the D sign. And what the D sign is, is a movement of the ventricular septum it's at the end systole. And the pressures in the right ventricle are so high caused by something, say, oh, the large PE caused the outflow obstruction, that they are pushing on the interventricular septum, causing it to collapse and causing it, causing the left ventricle to look kind of like a D. And we see an example of that in this image here. So even though I'm not really directly visualizing much of the right ventricle, I can still see that sign of elevated right ventricular pressure causing a D sign. Now the D sign is interesting because it is relatively specific for pulmonary embolus, unlike some of the other signs that we might look for. The D sign is between 85 and 95% specific for VE, depending on the study that you're looking at. 
Unfortunately, as with quite a few of our tests that are done at Pacific, it is not very sensitive, with sensitivities as low as 20% in some studies. So it's important to note that it is very helpful if you see it. It should definitely lead you towards the diagnosis of PE if you do see it in a patient where you already have that clinical suspicion. But it's so insensitive that if you don't see it, you've definitely not ruled anything out. That said, it is well worth looking for because of its high specificity. And it is also indicative of a PE that is causing hemodynamic changes for the patient by causing that ventricular collapse. Here we have a slightly more subtle D sign. All right, so that takes us to the apical four chamber. And the apical four chamber is really the heart of any exam that is focused on the right ventricle because this is the view that allows us to fully visualize that ventricle for the first time. Now, in an apical four chamber, we would like the interventricular septum to be as vertical as possible. If it's tilted to one side or the other, then it's hard to know exactly what cut through the heart you're making and you may falsely overestimate the size of the right ventricle. Now here we see all four chambers for the first time. On the side of my screen with the blue dot, the chamber closest to that dot is the right ventricle. The chamber across from it is the left and then we see the two atria at the bottom of the screen. In a normal healthy person, the right ventricle is approximately two thirds the size of the left ventricle. Any larger than that, we start to be concerned about right ventricular dilation. Right ventricular dilation is often associated with pulmonary embolus because you get that big clot and your heart is pushing against it. And basically the right ventricle just kind of blows up like a balloon. It's got thin walls. It reacts relatively quickly to that change in pressure. It does take a little bit of time for that to happen. So if your patient suddenly collapsed in the hospital cafeteria and was brought immediately to you, they might not have that yet, but in, in general, it happens relatively quickly. So 0.6 to one is concerning, and then anything greater than a one-to-one -one ratio is definitively abnormal. Your right ventricle should not be larger than your left ventricle. So here we have a view of a nice normal apical four chamber. So in comparison, here we have a view of a very abnormal right heart. So to start with, we have what I was just talking about. The right ventricle is large. It is as large or larger than the left ventricle. So we already know right off the bat that this patient has right ventricular dilation. And it is very likely in the right patient that something is causing that obstruction and causing high right ventricular pressures. And for us to see that, that ballooning up, that change in the heart. What we also see here is McConnell sign. And what McConnell sign is, is it is akinesis of the right ventricular free wall with preserved movement at the apex. And I, of all the ultrasound findings for right heart dysfunction, particularly for pulmonary embolism, McConnell sign is, is probably the most commonly talked about. In the original 1996 paper written by Dr. McConnell, he quotes a 94% specificity and 77% sensitivity. Now in papers since then, those numbers have changed and dropped to as low as a 15% sensitivity in some papers. I think that a lot of that change is because we are now diagnosing so many small subsegmental PEs that are not causing any kind of hemodynamic changes. I think those numbers are probably pretty accurate if you're talking about the big saddle embolus. And those are the ones we're really looking for on ultrasound, right? Like those are the ones with the critically ill, unstable patient. So I think the McConnell sign is still useful, is still worth looking for, but it is worth bearing in mind that the sensitivity of 77% quoted in the original paper you may need to take that with a little bit of a grain of salt. I think it's definitely lower than that, particularly if you're talking about segmentals. So it is worth bearing in mind that if you see this, it's very helpful. If you don't see this, you have not ruled out pulmonary embolus. Now, one of the very cool things and kind of newer and I think emerging things that we can do in the right heart is something called a tricuspid annular pulmonic systolic exertion or TAPSI as it is more commonly and much more easily to pronounce called. And what TAPSI does is it actually gives us prognostic indication because it looks for very early right heart dysfunction. Now, this is primarily studied in patients with pulmonary embolus. And the studies that have looked at it have linked this early dysfunction that we're gonna talk about in just a second with TAPSI to mortality at 30 days. And so I think that this is important and it is worth considering incorporating into your echocardiograms. And to get to what, to what you're gonna do is you're gonna go to M mode on your machine and you're gonna hit M mode once and you're gonna get that white line down the middle of your screen and you're gonna move it until it's over the lateral annulus of the tricuspid valve as we can see in this image here. 
drop that line straight across your screen. And then you're gonna hit M mode again. And what that's gonna do is it is going to give you a horizontal representation of movement over time of that at in lateral analysis of the tricuspid valve. And the idea here is that that valve should be moving briskly if you have a normal healthy person. It should be moving about greater than 18 millimeters when we measure from peak to valley. So if you look at the left-hand side of the screen, you can see the measurements. So you're measuring from peak to valley of that mountain and wave as it crosses the screen. And if it is greater than 18 millimeters, then that is indicative of normal function of the tricuspid valve. If it is less than 16 millimeters across all of these studies, then that is linked with a higher mortality at 30 days. And that is definitely a patient oriented outcome that I think we all care about. And I think the TAPSI is very useful because at my facility as, a, as in a lot of other facilities nationwide, we are starting to send more patients with PE home. And I know that that sometimes makes me a little bit uncomfortable. And one of the ways that I have incorporated this into my practice is that I'm going to send a patient with PE home, I will do this before I send them because I wanna to prove to myself that I'm not seeing that early sign of right heart dysfunction. Because what's great about this is you're gonna see it before you see the dilation. You're gonna see it before you see a McConnell sign, before you see that D sign, before that hemodynamic changes develop. And the nice thing about TAPC is that it's very straightforward to do because all you're using here is M mode. So I think it is worthwhile to be familiar with this. Um, this is an image from an article by Dr. Gottlieb et al. and is used with the permission of the authors. All right, so the last thing that I wanna address before I move into my conclusion is acute versus chronic. Because that is a question I very often asked when we're talking about echocardiograms. I think it's a really good question. And the question always is, okay, so I see this right ventricular dilation, but my patient's 85 and I don't really know his past medical history. And for all I know, he's had COPD for the last 20 years and he always has right ventricular dilation. How do I know if this is acute or if this is chronic? It's a great question. I think that the, the most straightforward way to try and answer this is to look at the, vent, the vent, right ventricular free wall in end diastole. And if that is less than five millimeters, then it is thin and it is more likely that if you're seeing dilation, that it is acute because that heart hasn't had time to thicken and remodel. And if it's greater than five millimeters, well, it's likely that your patient has experienced high right ventricular pressures over some significant period of time. So it is more likely that you are seeing someone that always has right ventricular dilation. And unless you have access to a prior echocardiogram, it is going to be difficult to know if there is like acute on chronic right ventricular dilation. But you can always look to see if the wall is thin because maybe it is and maybe you've taken that off the table. So here again, we have the same example we used earlier of that nice normal parasternal long axis view. And if we look at this next one, we look at that, that thick right ventricular free wall. I think we all know just looking at that, that that is greater than five millimeters. Could also hit pause and you can put the calipers on the screen at the end of diastole and you can measure it. You can prove to yourself that it is greater than or less than. Um, just one more example, again, that very thickened, chronically remodeled right ventricular wall. So I wanna conclude this by just briefly talking about one of the ways that I've incorporated this into my practice. So a patient comes in, uh, she's about 35 years old. She's telling me she had a cholecystectomy about three weeks ago and she is short of breath and she's tachycardic. So right from the beginning, I already really think that this patient has a PE. It's, it's not that this is a diagnostic conundrum, but the problem I'm starting to run into is her pressure is kind of soft and I can't get her to CT. The CT is blocked with a critically ill trauma patient. And I'm considering starting heparin on this patient, which makes me a little nervous. That's not exactly a no risk intervention. So I'll go ahead and throw the probe on there. And this is her actual parasternal long axis view. And you can see that there is definitely a little bit of right ventricular dilation here. That right ventricle I'm concerned looks larger than the aortic outflow tract in the left atrium. So I continue to my apical four and I couldn't quite get that nice vertical septum that I wanted to get. She was sitting up and tripoding. Um, but certainly based on the view I got, I'm very concerned. I think I see a McConnell sign. I'm concerned that the right and the left ventricle appear to be the same size. And so based on these images, I'm able to convince myself, yes, your clinical gestalt is correct. It is very likely that the patient has a PE. Go ahead and start the heparin. So I start the heparin. When she gets over to CT, sure enough, she's got multiple segmental pulmonary emboli. 
Her labs come back an hour and a half later. Her BNP is elevated. Her trope is mildly elevated. Uh, she was admitted for catheter-directed thrombolysis and ultimately did very well. But the ultrasound was incredibly helpful to me in this case in getting that heparin started quickly, getting her taken care of, confirming my diagnosis, helping me know that I wasn't anchoring too early on the wrong thing. So I think that red heart ultrasound is very useful. I think it is definitely something that we as emergency physicians can take and use and really use to improve the care of our patients. I've got my contact information up here. I love to talk about all things ultrasound. So please um, feel free to, to contact me anytime. If you wanna talk about ultrasound or debate the clinical utility of the 60-60 sign, I am always around. All right, thank you.